saying that scholarship is very important to this effort? Absolutely. To anything. Mm -hmm. Scholarship, study, systematic study is absolutely essential. And, and it sounds to me also uh, like we need a new perspective on this. Maybe not a new perspective, but in fact an ancient one. Exactly. It, it is really ultimately the perspective that all human beings use when they engage in their own self-definition and that is that they then try to identify those things which accentuate their capacities for survival that's what people do mm -hmm. it's not a black thing it's not a white thing it's not a european it's not an african it's what people do people try to perpetuate their ability to survive most effectively that's the perspective that we must adopt so have uh, white folk around the world uh, been very good at that perspective situation uh, to the detriment of people of color in the study of African people yes it's, it's been devastating uh, white people around the world generally speak as I said earlier with little information little um, valid information about African people by looking from their own perspective and sometimes in the service of political systems you know for example the psychologist and I'm a psychologist the psychologist at the beginning of this century um, were main contributors to white supremacy through their misuse of things like IQ tests and they specifically stated that blacks were genetically inferior to whites and they still say that you it, know, it persists today the bell curve, over, the bell over, curve. over 50 well see the bell curve is important but what's more important is that before the bell curve came out a survey was done of a thousand white psychologists who were fellows, either senior superior level psychologists reported in the book by Snyderman and Rothman and over 50 percent of them believed that white people were genetically superior to black. Oh. That's before the bell curve came out. Well, how do we turn this around? Uh, does your scholarship go for naught? I hear people who criticize it as, as saying it's new wave and, and not based in fact. Our scholarship, by characterizing it, is not scholarly. Uh, you have to challenge the documentation, the data, but name-calling hardly uh, qualifies as scholarship. So I think that whoever said that is describing themselves. It is predictable. In fact, for me, one of the things that validates the legitimacy of the scholarship is that it is challenged. <laughs> and we would expect it to be challenged. And we presume that the challenge is going to be persistent. And we're hoping, however, that we will get the same kind of legitimate challenge, though, that other people get. That is, challenge me with facts. Don't call me names. Don't compare me with someone else's criteria. Let's look at the merits of what we are representing and the data that I bring to affirm what I'm trying to say. And I think that this is a part of the whole scientific enterprise. It's always a dialogue. We collect all of this data. How does it enable us as African people uh, to better our condition, especially here in America? Well, I don't know how you would function without information. You know, uh, I think that one thing we have to remember is that not only are all groups to be identified by their culture and ethnicity and so forth, but all groups, every group, and particularly every successful group, has a systematic strategy to socialize its children. In other words, that's not an accident. You don't, you don't uh, leave that to chance. You put your children through a process to create the person that you want them to become. Haven't we had that before? And did well, we lose it somewhere? I think that if you observe what happens to many young people in the African community right now, is that many of them are literally raising themselves. Mm. Uh, the, the formal social organization, formal involvement in churches and organizations that take sustained periods of time, led by knowledgeable senior adults, uh, to tell people what they need to know, to uh, provide them with a value system, to give them legitimation and, and so forth, uh, the tightness of the structure that makes that happen has, um, has weakened uh, considerably. And so what you see is children that are basically raising children, and that's unfortunate. But every group should have that structure to socialize its children. So again, I asked you the question. Let me mm -hmm. restate it. Where did we lose it, and, and how did we lose it? 
uh, because it was there before. Everybody, Dr. Akbar, everybody tells the story uh, of Miss Mary down the street who could whip you mm -hmm. and you got another whipping when you got home. We had that. People in our generation certainly had it. Where did we lose it? Within one generation? Well, it's been clear that it's been under siege ever since we've been here. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, we, we, and what we had in many ways was an adaptation to conditions that were constantly threatening the lives of our families. And because we were clear about our shared, uh, our shared oppression, if you will, I mean, we were forced into a cage where we had no doubt that our condition was one that was undesirable. We wanted to get out of that cage. Once the this de desegregation came along, once we began to get this illusion of freedom, freedom because we were now able to live in other people's reality, then we began to give up the perception, the, the shared perception that we had a shared kind of threat going on. And as a result of that, we lost a lot of the adaptive things that kept us surviving. So I think that began to, de to uh, de uh, de 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 deteriorate those forces that worked to preserve the integrity of how we raised our children and preserved our families. You, you also have to realize that there are things that are done to us that weaken our capacity to sustain our institutions. Such as? Job discrimination, uh, the decline of educational opportunities, uh, Hollywood uh, propaganda, ne negative images about African people, 